previously on yet another canal adventure. We've noticed that the temperature gauge is a little higher than it should be. We limp along for a while so we can moor up by bridge 56 which meant that we were closer to a road and we could get the car near to the boat. In this vlog we're going to explain what happened next and how we dealt with the issue. As we tell you our woes, you'll be viewing our real-time journey from Bridge 56 to Foxton Locks. Grab yourself a cup of tea and some biscuits and sit back, relax and enjoy the cruise, whilst we share our story. You left us last time on Sunday the 21st of April, which turned out to be the last day of our Easter cruise. The engine was overheating and we decided that once we had the boat somewhere accessible by road, rather than in the middle of nowhere, we would end our cruise and moor up. To say we were disappointed to abandon the cruise was an understatement. We did not know what was causing the engine to overheat. As the engine was too hot to do anything with, we raised the deck boards and then had a cup of tea and ate the chocolate bunnies. Ours is an Isuzu marine engine. Here's a picture so you're seeing what we would see when we were under the deck boards. If we include the water in the engine, the header tank and the skin tank of the boat, we know that there's roughly 35 litres of water here. We check the engine maintenance manual for troubleshooting tips. As I read the manual, I'm reminded of the generation game. On the troubleshooting conveyor belt tonight, we have insufficient coolant amount, fan belt slippage, thermostat malfunction, radiator filler cap malfunction, cooling system interior fouled, radiator clogging, engine overload, a cuddly toy, air cleaning element clogging, insufficient ventilation. We had been on the boat for three days, during which we hadn't refilled the water tank. The nearest water point is in front of us along the canal at the top of Foxton Locks, which is about a mile away from where we moored at Bridge 56. We only have basic tools on board. Our toolbox is back in the car, which is 14 miles away at the marina. Google Maps claims that it's a four and a half hour walk. We decide that walking back to the car is not an option. There is another option. Foxton Locks Inn, which is a pub, is about a 30 minute walk away. That would be an easy location for a taxi firm to come and pick us up from. We agree to go to the pub. Gathering together some essential items that we would need, glasses, prescription tablets, maps, water bottles, vlog camera, these were all shoved into a rucksack. We were good to go. After locking up the boat, getting a what free words location for the off-road parking area by the footbridge, we head off along the towpath. Passing other boaters who are having a barbecue, disturbing their dogs who give us a friendly bark. Walking along we discuss the plan of action. Get to the pub, phone a cab, get to the car, go home. We need to get a few items together so that we can completely drain the coolant from the engine. We also talk about calling a mechanic for advice. Worst case scenario, we may be without means of propulsion for a while, so we add contacting the CRT to a list of things to do. Passing under the second bridge spanning the canal, I notice some steps leading up to the road passing over it. I have a quick look to see if there is parking for a vehicle here too. When I return to the towpath, I find Paul frantically looking in the rucksack for the car keys. The keys are not in there. We have the sudden realisation that the car keys are back on the boat. After a few choice words, I head back to the boat and retrieve the car keys. Paul stays put and talks to the horses. Passing the barbecuing boaters and their nice barky dogs, I get back to the boat, unlock the boat, find the car keys, lock the boat up and head back along the towpath towards Paul and Foxton. I get barked at a third time. 
Paul had continued to walk slowly towards Foxton Locks. It didn't take too long for me to catch up with him again. When we finally arrived at Foxton Locks Inn, we had a drink. We also asked for a local cab firm's telephone number and then called it and ordered a taxi. The taxi arrived and we were soon being whisked through the Leicestershire and Northamptonshire countryside, passing through the village of Naseby, which was the site of a decisive engagement of the First English Civil War in June 1645. It was here that Cromwell's forces were victorious. It's historically important because this battle marked the beginning of the end for the Royalists in the war. History lesson over, we arrived back at the car and headed home. The next day was Easter Monday. We wrote out a list of items that we needed to buy and then gathered some items that we already had at home that we would need. We filled a very large water container with water and loaded it into the car. We gathered up some buckets, some empty fizzy pop two litre bottles and a whole heap of old towels and some dust sheets. This could get messy. We set off to the stores in Milton Keynes with our shopping list. We purchased a hand siphon, jubilee clips, a metre of replacement rubber hose and some engine coolant. You know, the sort of items that you need for a bank holiday Monday on a narrowboat. After buying everything we thought we would need, we take our heavily laden shopping bags back to the car. We enter the what three words location we took yesterday into our sat nav and follow the directions back to the bridge along a single track farm road and park up as close to the boat as we can possibly get. We carry all the shopping, the toolbox, the other items from home and the water container to the boat and have a nice cup of tea. After some careful consideration we decide to start at the top of the list of items that could cause an engine to overheat. Number one is fan belt slippage, so we take to task replacing the fan belt. Sounds nice and simple, doesn't it? The fan belts, yep, two of them, connect from the flywheel of the engine to the alternators. One for leisure batteries, the yellow arrow on the left of the picture, and one to recharge the engine starter battery, the yellow arrow on the right of the picture. The engine battery one also drives the water pump. The fan belt for this is located behind the larger belt, which means that we have to take off the larger belt and remove the flywheel to replace the smaller one. That could be the cause of the slippage, and therefore causing the engine to overheat. There may be a simpler way of doing this. If there is, please do let us know in the comments below. The fan belt is replaced, the flywheel reattached, the alternators move back into place, and the bolts tightened. Once we are happy that everything is back to how it was, we check that there are no screws left over. There aren't. Looking good. We turn the engine on and have a cup of tea. The temperature creeps up again, so we turn the engine off and allow it to cool. Back to the list. Thermostat malfunction. OK, at this time we're going to discount this. The gauge is showing the engine is getting hot, which it is. So it seems to be working. It starts registering as cool when we first switch the engine on. And then it slowly creeps up. It should get to about 80, 85, 90. That's the working temperature of the engine. But it keeps creeping further up than that. So we think the thermostat is actually working. I <sighs> Is discounting this at this point a schoolboy error? Hopefully not. Radiator filler cap malfunction. We've checked the seal all around the bottom, the little rubber ring around the bottom of the filler cap and that looks okay. We check that the spring mechanism is, well, you know, springy. Um, that all appears to be normal. We've tried to look for a replacement, but it appears that our filler cap is something that is slightly unique, which is just a little bit worrying. Um, but our, we think our existing cap is okay, so 
we're discounting that as well. So next on the list uh, is cooling system interior fouled, uh, which is closely followed by radiator clogging. This is it then. This is the big one. We need to drain the coolant from the engine and the skin tank of the boat. So we need to remove all of the coolant rubber hoses and pipes that are around the engine and going to a skin tank to check for a blockage. We need to check the inside of the hoses for wear and tears that could cause for blockage and generally just check that everything is in good working order and healthy. We can see through it, light at the end of the tunnel and all that. Um, that's quite a big job. We prepare our working area covering anything electrical, alternators, etc. with plastic bags and old towels to prevent them getting wet. We hand siphon the water out of the header tank down to the water pump level. The water is pumped into fizzy pop bottles. Next, the rubber hoses that connect the header tank to the water pump were removed and checked for blockages. There weren't any. We shine a light into the top of the water pump and check for blockages. Again, there weren't any. We remove the temperature sender from the side of the water pump and clean up its contacts using WD-40. We set about draining the system further. Have you ever hand siphoned 35 litres of water and coolant from an engine? It seems to take forever. Unfortunately, there is no camera footage of us carrying out the engine maintenance, as we're describing on this vlog. It's difficult to film or take pictures when you're contorted over an engine, holding a bucket with your knees, one hand on a siphon bowl pumping, the other hand holding the rubber hose somewhere near the bucket between your legs. With that mental image firmly implanted, we'll have a little bit of music so you can go and grab yourself a drink.
When the system was finally drained, we had a cup of tea. All of the coolant water was safely stored in fizzy pop bottles and buckets on the towpath, with great care taken not to pollute the canal water or the hedgerow. There were rubber hoses, metal pipes and jubilee clips everywhere. Each hose was checked for damage inside and out. The metal pipe was fine, the skin tank was empty and there didn't appear to be any gunge failing the inlet or outlet of the tank. We were pretty confident at this point that there wasn't anything blocking or fouling the hoses. Now all we had to remember was how to put it all back together again. Each of the rubber hoses was reattached to the point of the engine it had been earlier removed from. The Jubilee clips were fastened and double checked. Once all the hoses and pipes were in place, we then started to refill the water with the contents of some of the fizzy pop bottles. We topped these up with the water from the container that we had carried from home and we added a little more coolant as we went along. Adding the water back into the engine did take a little while. We didn't want to rush at this point. We were using the bleed valve on the skin tank to release trapped air and were slowly filling the overflow tank on the top of the engine with the replacement coolant water ensuring that after filling we gave it time to drain down through the rest of the system. When we thought that there was enough water in the system we left it for another 20 minutes before checking the levels again. We then topped up the level to what it should be and again left it for another 20 minutes. Once again we checked the bleed valve on the skin tank and a little air escaped followed by a little bit of water. We topped the overflow tank up a little bit more and after checking for leaks around the engine we removed the towels, dust sheets and plastic bags from the alternators. We carried out an engine check. Oil, belts, water. We checked there wasn't anything fouling the engine air intake or filter. All looking good. We were ready to start the engine. The electrics were turned back on. Had we mentioned that we'd isolated the engine battery whilst we'd carry out the work? Well we had, so that needed the isolation switch turned back to the on position. The key was turned in the ignition. After a short count to allow the glow plugs time to warm, the key was fully turned and the engine fired into life. Now all we could do was wait and watch the temperature gauge. Let's have a quick recap of what we've done. We read the troubleshooting guide at the back of the engine manual to find a list of things to check. Insufficient coolant. We checked and the colour of the water and coolant mix looks about right. The water is still clear and the coolant colour is a vivid blue. Fan belt slippage. We've replaced the fan belt that runs around the water pump and the engine starter battery alternator. Thermostat malfunction. The gauge is telling us that the engine is cool to start with and after running for a while gets way too hot. So we believe the thermostat is functioning. Radiator filler cap. This has been checked and appears to be in good working order. Cooling system interior failed. This has now been drained, tubes and pipes checked for damage inside and out, reassembled and the water refilled. Radiator clogging. Again, draining the system and removing the hoses has shown this not to be the case. Engine overload. We definitely were not cranking it. The rev counter was hardly, if ever, over 11,000 revs. Technically speaking, we were basically at impulse speeds. Air cleaner element clogging. We had changed the air filter before leaving Crick Marina at the start of the Easter cruise, where we had also changed the engine oil and changed the starter battery. We were relatively happy with the checks and minor amount of maintenance that we had done. Only time would tell if our tinkering would yield the results we so desperately desired. Whilst we were waiting to see if the engine would overheat again, we started to gather the items from the boat that we would need to take back home with us. Items from the fridge, dirty clothes, 
tools, rubbish and uneaten easter eggs. We loaded the car with the waste water that we hadn't put back into the engine, the empty fizzy pop bottles and buckets. Our Easter cruising plan had been to visit Welford and then head through Foxton Locks and reach Market Harborough before turning around and heading some of the way back towards Crick. The weather was ideal for cruising, the canal wasn't that busy and we had planned out the rest of the year's cruising to ensure that the boat was a little closer to home during the summer months so that we could invite friends and family to cruise with us. We started to question if that would all be possible now we were having engine troubles. There were just so many unanswered questions at this stage, and one of them being, why did we buy this boat? The nice weather was beginning to cause issues with water shortages and restricted lock opening times were being introduced across the network. All of these would cause us delays. Would we be able to get the boat back to the boatyard where we had booked it in for blacking at the end of July? One of the other questions that, that was playing on my mind at the time was should we have been filming our tinkering with the engine? I think at the time we were both on edge and having a camera on us would have added slightly more pressure than was needed at the time. I think we were still getting used to having a camera around us and there are times when you can just ignore it and get on with what you're doing and then there are times when you just get distracted by having a camera around you, especially when you're not used to it. It is an invasion into your life, which can produce some great moments. I know that people like the warts and all style that can be found on YouTube. However, our Easter cruise was about getting used to having a camera around us again after the short winter break, and also trying to move it about the boat a bit more to get some different camera angles. We were still unsure about having a camera around us, really. I've just realised that I haven't mentioned about the footage that's been playing on the screen. This video was from Saturday the 4th of May 2019, which was Star Wars Day. This was two weeks after our day of engine maintenance on the 22nd of April, which was Easter Monday. We started this journey very near to Bridge 56 on the Grand Union Canal, Leicester Arm, and we're heading north towards Foxton Locks. What is now called the Leicester Arm comprised two canals that were bought by the Grand Junction Canal in 1894, the Leicestershire and Northamptonshire Union Canal and the old Grand Union Canal. The River Saw had been made navigable up to Loughborough by 1780 and the route was extended to Leicester in 1794. The Leicestershire and Northamptonshire Union Canal was promoted to continue the waterway to Market Harborough and Northampton, where it would meet the River Neen and the planned branch from the Grand Junction Canal at Gatham. By 1797, when construction had only reached Gumley Debdale, the money had been used up. More money was raised in 1805 and the canal got to Market Harborough four years later. Meanwhile, the Grand Junction Canal from London to Braunston had opened. Alternative routes for joining the two canals were discussed and it was decided that a separate company to be called the Grand Union Canal should be formed to make the link. It is now often referred to as the Old Grand Union to distinguish it from the canal of the same name which was created in 1929 when the Grand Junction merged with several other canals. This opened from Norton Junction to Foxton in 1814, which provided a direct route from the East Midland Coalfield and industrial towns down to London. The canal was never prosperous. Railway competition from the 1840s meant declining revenues, which led to reductions in maintenance. When in the early 1890s the Grand Junction was looking to revive the East Midlands trade, the two companies were very willing to be bought out, so in 1894 the Grand Junction paid £6,500 for the Leicestershire and Northamptonshire Union and £10,500 for the Old Grand Union, the better price of the latter probably reflecting the value of its reservoirs rather than its canal. The Grand Junction rectified the arrears of maintenance, dredging their new purchases and built the incline plane at Foxton, bypassing the ten locks and speeding for passage of the boats. 
A further inclined plane was planned to bypass Watford Locks, but was never built. Unfortunately, it was all too late. Traffic grew slightly, but not by enough to make working Foxton Incline economic, and in 1910 it was closed and traffic reverted to using the locks. As we are approaching the end of this vlog, you are probably wondering if we did manage to fix the overheating engine issue we were having during our Easter cruise. Did we resolve the issue on Easter Monday before heading back home and to work the next day? Before I answer that, I'd like to say thank you for watching and listening to this vlog. If you've liked what you have seen or heard, then please do give us a thumbs up. If you haven't, then thank you for your time anyway. You can subscribe to our channel by clicking on the subscribe button. Please do, it means a lot to us both that people are bothering to subscribe to us. If you wish to be notified when we next post a vlog, then hit the bell icon for that. Good news everyone, we've reached Bridge 60 and the Welcome to Foxton Locks sign. Our engine ran for a couple of hours under very little load. We were moored up so were not physically moving. The temperature gauge did creep up to 95 degrees, but then dropped back down to 80 and remained constantly at 80 for the two hours. Paul revisited the boat as he was travelling past it for work in the two weeks between Easter and the first bank holiday weekend in May. He started the engine each time and ran it for another few hours. The temperature of the engine remained normal each time. The overheating of the engine at this point appeared to be fixed. Thanks for watching. Join us next time as we pass through Foxton Locks on yet another canal adventure.